That's the problem. <laughs> the sophist is a sophist. And he's going to unwittingly share insights that he doesn't understand. Your task is to separate the sophistry from what's profound. Your task That's the that's the dialogue. Right? Mm-hmm. Now how can you prove this? Read. You don't need to go more than three or four pages to wrap it up and confirm that this is true. That's true. I propose we get someone to read on the first hint that Plato is showing sophistry stop the game. Got a copy? I don't. It looks like. Okay, we borrow. Go ahead. According to our yesterday's agreement, Socrates, we have come ourselves as we were bound to do, and we bring also this man with us. He is a stranger from Elia, one of the followers of Parmenides and Zeno, and a real philosopher. Jump in. Just Thomas Taylor says yeah. he is Elian by birth, but very different from the associates of Parmenides and Zia, Zeno. Mm. He is, however, a great philosopher. Mm. Wow, that's quite different. <laughs> what do you make of that? But Thomas Taylor is more right on. Barbara says Thomas Taylor is more right on. Right, Mark? Why? Well, because he says Tolan Genos ex Theodorus is someone. He's of the Elean race. uh, Mm -hmm. Who plays a major role in the Theotetus. 
And he's a good person to be able to judge who is a philosopher and who is not. No way. Right? Okay, let that slip. Okay, about, go ahead. How about the idea that he has no name? He comes in and you always find that this is a person, they always introduce him by a name. But this person has no name. He's a stranger from Aaliyah and has no name. What would you what, think? Go ahead, keep going. Uh, that he, he is not somebody that is known for one, and <laughs> distinguished. That's your point. That since he is being described as a stranger, right, it's likely they don't know him. Right. That's a possibility, right? So we hold that and go further and see yes, whether but it shows they, itself they, up. But yet they claim that he's a real philosopher. Okay. Well, there's also the cultural right. mm -hmm. here. Go ahead. Here. here. Barbara. Hi. There's also the Greek cultural tradition of the gods appearing as strangers in uh, Greek Which mythology. Question? And so that he says, are you not unwilling, unwittingly bringing, as Homer says, some god? Right, because that that is the mythology that gods the gods walk on the earth in uh, disguise. So I think it's a significant thing. He is a stranger, and we'll have to see what of what ilk he is. What is the okay. question? She said that uh, there's a Greek cultural tradition of mythology, yeah. mythological tradition of making the gods appear as strangers. <laughs> well, they walk among us. There's Bacchus and Philemon is one myth, but other myths where the gods are in disguise, walking on... So we'll see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And right. the word, it's not really, <laughs> it's not real philosopher, it's Andra, right? Like manly or stalwart. It's not true. It's not aletheas or aletheis. Just Charge? Mm -hmm. Does that, does it make any, uh, in the Parmenides, doesn't Socrates say to Zeno, you, you manfully describe that? That's probably a similar route. That's probably, that's in my recollection right now, I couldn't say for sure. But that word manfully is often a form of Who's the talking? word man. Barbara. Is, well, I'm just talking about, it's not real philosopher. It's the word an, andra, which means like a manly or a stalwart or something along that kind. It has a masculine kind of comes from a masculine root doesn't necessarily mean a man, but it would be a very strong woman. So you could translate it, I don't know if you agree, Barbara, exceedingly a philosophical man? Oh, I don't know about that. Well, but you, she hold it. But let's hold it, because Theo wants to go more okay. pages and it's already <laughs> God. Don't you Are you not unwittingly bringing, as Homer says, some god and no mere stranger, Theodorus? He says that the gods, and especially the god of strangers, enter into companionship with men who have a share of due reverence, and that they behold the deeds, both violent and righteous, of mankind. So perhaps this companion of yours may be one of the higher powers who comes to watch over and refute us because we are worthless in argument a kind of god of refutation. No, Theodorus, that is not the stranger's character. He is more reasonable than those who devote themselves to disputation. And though I do not think he is a god at all, I certainly do not think he is divine. I certainly do think he is divine, for I give that epithet to all philosophers. And rightly, my friend. However... I fancy it is not much easier, if I may say so, to recognize this class than that of the gods. For these men, I mean those who are not feignedly but really philosophers, appear disguised in all sorts of shapes, 
thanks to the ignorance of the rest of mankind. And visit the cities, beholding from above the life of those below. And they seem to some to be of no worth, and to others to be worth everything. And sometimes they appear disguised as statesmen, and sometimes as sophists. And sometimes they may give some people the impression that they are altogether mad. But I should like to ask our stranger here, if agreeable to him, what people in his country thought about these matters, and what names they used. What matters do you mean? Sophist, statesman, philosopher. What particular difficulty, and what kind of difficulty in regard to them, is it about which you had in mind to ask? It is this. Did they consider all these one or two? Or, as there are three names, did they divide them into three classes and ascribe to each a class corresponding to a single name? I think he has no objection to talking about them. What do you say, stranger? Someone maybe stranger? Well, just what you did... Theodorus, for I have no objection, and it is not difficult to say that they consider them three, but it is no small or easy task to define clearly the nature of each. The fact is, Socrates, that by chance you have hit upon a question very like what we happened to be asking him before we came here, and he made excuses to us then, as he does now to you, though he admits that he has heard it thoroughly discussed and remembers what he heard. In that case, stranger, do not refuse us the first favor we have asked, but just tell us this. Do you generally prefer to expound in a long, uninterrupted speech of your own whatever you wish to explain to anyone? Or do you prefer the method of questions? I was present once when Parmenides employed the latter method and carried on a splendid discussion. I was a young man then, and he was very old. The method of dialogue, Socrates, is easier with an interlocutor who is tractable and gives no trouble. But otherwise, I prefer the continuous speech by one person. Well, you may choose whomever you please of those present. They will all respond pleasantly to you. <laughs> but if you take my advice, you will choose one of the young fellows, Theotetus here, or any of the others who suits you. Socrates, this is the first time I have come among you, and I am somewhat ashamed. Instead of carrying on the discussion by merely giving brief replies to your questions, to deliver an extended, long, drawn-out speech, either as an address of my own or in reply to another, as if I were giving an ex exhibition. But I must for really the present, but I must for really the present subject is not what one might expect from the form of the question, but is a matter for very long speech. On the other hand, it seems unfriendly and discourteous to refuse a favor to you, and these gentlemen, especially when you have spoken as you did. As for Theotetus, I accept him most willingly as interlocutor, locutor, in view of my previous conversation with him and of your presentation, present recommendation. We have a Theotetus. Yep. But stranger, by taking this course and following Socrates' suggestion, will you please the others too? I'm afraid there's nothing more to be said about that, Theotetus. But for now, but from now on, my talk will, I fancy, be addressed to you. And if you get tired and are bored by the length of the talk, do not blame me, but these friends of yours. Oh, no. I do not think I shall get tired of it so easily. But if such a thing does happen, we will call in this Socrates, the namesake of the other Socrates. He is, he is of my age and my companion in the gymnasium, and is in the habit of working with me 
in almost everything. Very well. You will follow your own devices about that as the discussion proceeds. But now, you and I must investigate in common, beginning first, as it seems to me, with the sophist, and must search out and make plain by argument what he is. For as yet, you and I have nothing in common about him but the name. But as to the thing to which we give the name, we may perhaps each have a conception of it in our own minds. However, we ought always in every instance to come to agreement about the thing itself by argument, rather than about the mere name without argument. But the tribe which we now intend to search for, the sophist, is not the easiest thing in the world to catch and define. And everyone has agreed long ago that if investigations of great matters are to be properly worked out, we ought to practice them on small and easier matters before attacking the very greatest. So now, Theotetus, this is my advice to ourselves. Since we think the family of sophists is troublesome and hard to catch, that we first practice the method of hunting in something easier unless you perhaps have some simpler way to suggest. I have not. Then shall we take some lesser thing and try to use it as a pattern for the greater? Yes. Well then, what example can we set before us which is well known and small, but no less capable of de definition than any of the greater things? Say an angular, anger. Is he not known to all and unworthy of any great interest? Yes. But I hope he offers us a method and is capable of a definition not unsuitable to our purpose. That would be good. Come now, let us begin with him in this way. Tell me, shall we say that he is a man with an art, or one without an art, but having some other power? Certainly not one without an art. But of all arts, there are, speaking generally, two kinds. How so? Agriculture, and all kinds of care of any living beings, and that which has to do with things which are put together or molded, utensils we call them. And the art of imitation, all these might properly be called by one name. How so? And what is the name? When anyone brings into being something which did not previously exist, we say that he who brings it in, brings it into being, produces it. And that which is brought into being is produced. Certainly. Now all the arts which we have just mentioned direct their energy to production. Yes, they do. Let us then call these collectively the productive art. Agreed. And after this comes the whole class of learning. And what of acquiring knowledge and money making and fighting and hunting? None of these is creative, but they are all engaged in coercing by deeds or words things which already exist and have been produced, or in preventing others from coercing them. Therefore, all these divisions together might very properly be called acquisitive art. Yes, that would be proper. Then since acquisitive and productive art compromise all the arts in which the Atitas, in which the Atitas shall we place the art of angling? In acquisitive art, clearly. Acquisitive. Acquisitive art, clearly. And are there not two classes of acquisitive art? One of the class of exchange between voluntary agents by means of gifts and wages and purchases, and the other, which comprises all the rest of acquisitive art. And since it coerces either by word or deed, might be called coercive. It appears so, at any rate, from what, what what you have said. Well then, 
shall we not divide the cor uh, cor say it, Barbara. Coercive. Cor coercive art into two parts. In what way? By calling all the open part of it fighting and all the secret part hunting. Yes. But it would be unreasonable not to divide hunting into two parts. Say how it can be done. By dividing it into the hunting of the lifeless and of the living. Certainly, if both exist. Of course they exist. And we must pass over the hunting of lifeless things, which has no name with the exception of some kinds of diving and the like, which are of little importance. But the hunting of living things we will call animal hunting. Very well. And two classes of animal hunting might properly be made. Okay. One. That's all. <laughs> yes, and he goes on and on and on. Okay. Well, Make a judgment. He's a is the dude a sophist? Yes. What grounds would you say is a sophist? He blames others and it, it's he blames others for the reasoning of the argument rather than himself who's supposed to be guiding it. I, I don't know. It, it, it's all just puzzles me. The first thing is that he is calling things by names without really defining it, saying these arts are coercive. Just by saying so doesn't make it so. And then he says, it, well, we'll call it um, fighting. The open part is fighting and the secret part is hunting. So he, he makes two delineations without any reasoning for doing so. And everyone's supposed to accept his nomenclature and his divisions. Well. <coughs> sure, it does, um... what, uh, one other thing that he mentions, and after this, the, this comes the whole class of learning and that of acquiring knowledge. And he puts that into money making and fighting and hunting, all of those together. None of these is creative, but they are all engaged in coercive by deeds or words. So he has a very negative view of acquiring knowledge and learning, which is coercive. And so even, even this dialogue will be coercive if we're trying to learn about the sophists. Do you agree? Do you agree with huh. Come on. Do you agree? A point is being made? She sounds like an extension of the dialogue. I don't know, it's kind of... I'm not sure that that would make him a song. <laughs> It's very difficult to describe what a sophist is. Yes. Um, does he give good reasons why it's difficult mm -hmm. to name a sophist? Mm -hmm. What are the reasons he gives why it's difficult to describe a sophist? Mm. search out and make plain by argument what he is. Right? That doesn't say what why he's hard to yeah. It's 
says it's because. Mm. Show you, come on. Um, Got a paragraph, come on. We're into a paragraph. We're finding out why he thinks it's difficult to define a sophist. Hey, 218, V5, and the load, 271. But if we're going to use the name, we have to come to an agreement about its meaning. But what's the difficulty in reaching that? The tribe which we now intend to search for, the soft, is not the easiest thing in the world to catch and define. And everyone has agreed long ago that if investigations of great matters are to be properly worked out, we ought to practice on small and easier matters. So he's saying that they, to define this individual and to catch them is not the easiest task. It's troublesome and hard to catch. Look her. The reason you can't name him so far is what's the reason? <laughs> Going in the quote that Gina just used? It's too great. He's hard to catch. Uh, yeah, yes, in front of that. Mm. It is not the easiest thing in the world. That's why it's difficult. It's not the easiest <laughs> thing in the world. Right? That's a good reason why you can't define it. Because it is not the easiest thing in the world. And he has already stated that he likes the easiest way. Easiest person. Right. Easiest everything. Because mm -hmm. it's not the easiest thing in the world to catch. By the way, why do you have to catch him? Yeah. <laughs> mm. No particular reason. You're just trying to, you want to define an idea, don't you? Mm -hmm. you say, the trouble is it's not the easiest thing in the world. That's why we can't define it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like it might be the second easiest, but it's not the easiest. Or the third easiest. So what? Really? Doesn't sound like it makes it. But if it were the easiest thing in the world, then you could do it. I guess so. Yeah. Is that the logic? Yeah. yeah. Come on. That's the logic. Okay. Look, next up. The big big one. And is it true? And is the statement that follows true? Everyone has agreed long ago that an investigation of great matters ought to be properly worked out. We ought to practice them on small and easier matters before attacking the very great. No. Yes, you're all, yes, right? But he's already. But he said that this is the is not easy, and now he's going to practice on the easier things to catch the most difficult. Therefore, 
it's contradictory. It is going for the easiest thing. Oh, <laughs> the sophist is the easiest, okay. Look, come on. Do you agree, it's been agreed long ago, that investigations of great matters are properly worked out, we ought to practice them on small and easier matters. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yes or no? Come on. Yeah, I'm saying no. Give me an example of something that you do in the game of philosophy. I know. What is beauty? Well, everybody agrees if you want to explore about the nature of beauty, what you really must do is you practice on small and easier matters. Uh. <laughs> Therefore, there's no gauge, is there? I mean, how do you measure it? How do you if you, if you practice on easiest matters? No, you don't. You just go for it. Then you work up to the subject. Is that right? Oh, yeah, that's a few things. Right, everybody agrees that's a way to pursue. Well, no. <laughs> no? No. You study the greatest matters. What's that have to do with <laughs> defining what a sophist is? By the way, you talk about before things? you look for examples of it, is it usual to proceed looking for an example before you know what it is? No. <laughs> How do you know it's an example? Right. Well, how would you know the example fits unless you know what you're talking about? Yeah. Right. Is that likely or unlikely? Likely. Oh. By the way, the best way to proceed is to look for, uh, you want to work on things most akin to the thing you're interested in, or the easiest matter. <coughs> most akin. Most akin. Mm. Oh, forget that. <laughs> so then, my advice to ourselves, then to a whole bunch of sophists, it's hard to catch them. His assumption is, hey, again, should you not explain why it's hard to catch them, or if you have to catch them, mm -hmm. or what difference does it make if it's hard to catch them? You're supposed to define mm -hmm. the idea, not catch them. Yeah. Look, if you want to find out what a doctor is, a physician, well, you want to look around for things that are the least like him. <laughs> I practice on that. <laughs> right? No? Mm. Then let's for mm. let's look for the least and then work on that to the greatest. By the way, is that a good way to pursue? No metal, no mean, but just go from the, <laughs> the thing that's, I got it. We'll go looking for the thing that is least like the sophist hmm. and explore that and then go for the more difficult. How's that? <laughs> what? No. Forget that, that's a minor point. Um, Say, let's pick the easiest thing. An angler. That's the easiest thing to define. Sure. <laughs> most difficult fishing. Okay. By the way, 
he should fit. Anybody uh, ever see fishing or? Oh, then you'll be a good man to talk about. Right, right, let's do it. Okay. Um, does he have an R? Yes or no? that can benefit a subject and improve their status? No. Nope. No. Then you have an art. Well, does the angler have an art? No. No. Nope. Starting on the right foot. Hey, arts are two kinds. Agree? Mm nothing else but this paragraph. Which paragraph is here? Here? What? Which paragraph? Oh, I'm following the logic of it. And two nineteen B. And there are generally speaking two kinds of art. Agriculture and all kinds of care of any living beings. Two. And that which has to do with things that are put together like utensils, so that's beneficial, right? Mm -hmm. A worker, mm -hmm. right? He's making utensils. So what do we have so far? We got three, don't we? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Agriculture, right? And a very interesting thing. Husbandry, right? And care of any living beings. By the way, uh, do you only need an art when you're deficient? Mm -hmm. But he's a care for all living beings. Don't that skip, skip that. Mm -hmm. okay. They don't need care, and, don't need an art. And you add that, the art of imitation. Four, agreed? They fit naturally in the same class, don't they? No. Agriculture fits in the class of imitation. <laughs> no. Right? No. And putting together things, just like agriculture, is it not? No. No? No. It doesn't fit. Well, Theotetus must object to it. But he doesn't. Good heavens. So we're going to call this 
productive. We're going to call it the productive art. Four things. What are they? Agriculture, making th fitting things into place, utensils, care of living things, and the art of imitation. <laughs> this is good. Care, care of living things is productive. And that's called being productive. Right. <laughs> that's odd. Right. Someone is good at imitation, they're producing something, aren't they? <laughs> No, they're excellent. It's the imitation. Sure. Aren't they? Is the thing they're producing like agriculture? <coughs> no. Oh. But agriculture. How do they belong together? Produces things. Or does the art of imitation produce illusions? Yeah. Oh, well, that's still producing something. <laughs> or nothing. What? That's what poetry is, right? Yeah. That's what poetry is, isn't it? That's what? Poetry is an imitative skill, art. And does it benefit people who are involved in it? Why not? Not without an antidote. All right, okay. One more step. And after this comes, okay, how many things in the next class? Four? Five. Right? Got them all? Yeah. Do they all fit? No. Hey, do they all fit? No. What? No. Yeah. What? Why not? Well, because fighting and hunting are not part of the learning and acquiring knowledge class. Nor is my, well, I'm not answering the question, so I don't know how to answer it. Do they fit in inquisitive art? So, um, let's go through them, okay? What's the first? Learning. Yeah, and that differs from acquiring knowledge, isn't it? <laughs> no. It isn't? No. Oh. <laughs> mean it doesn't fit? No. Oh. And money making? <laughs> no. And fighting? No. And hunting? Or do they have? None of these is creative. And you certainly know that's true. Right? Because people who learn things are never creative. <laughs> Nor productive. And they are all engaged in coercing by deeds or words. Not fighting. Things that already exist and have been produced. Or in preventing others from uh, coercing them. So look her. Does he have two classes? Uh. Okay, let's do it. Learning. And acquiring learning. So I'll just make that note there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Money making, fighting, hunting. See, it's the next category that's important. None of these is creative, but they're all engaged 
and coercing what? Things which already exist and have been produced. Hey. They, all of these things, come from the productive art. distinction? No. And, and if all of these things come from the productive, productive art, as you looked over here, remember that list of things? Yeah. Why, wow, that's amazing. There aren't any utensils in there, and there aren't is a care, and there isn't anything to do with agriculture. But there aren't an imitation. <laughs> right, that's a good one, right? And I like utensils, right? And um, care of, of any living beings. Agriculture. Well, these things, whatever they are, their products. Their products become these four. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. And that's why there are two separate views of art. Hmm. By the way, uh, if something comes from something, does that make it uh, separate classes? No. Of things? No, they Well, forget that. That's mm. minor. <laughs> right, let's shift that. Be in the same class. Yeah. Okay, uh, now let's do the best one. So now that we have all of this, where are we going to put the angle? So he built this whole thing to be able to classify it in terms of art and uh, that came out of the productive art. Uh, let's see, uh, he has the art of imitation, utensils. Um, takes care of all living things and agriculture. Right. Yeah. Does that 
Good? No. Not if you're caring for all living things and you're hunting them. Uh, we'll skip this. It's just, just go on. This is perhaps the uh, fine argument. Um, then since the acquisitive and the productive art comprise all the arts, no. Um, we can get uh, medicine, uh, uh, do doctors, pilots. Uh, we can get um, um, be, it might be important. If, um, where the shepherd has an arm. Um, the seaman, a uh, captain of a sailing ship. That dude should have an arm. Oh, where would you put it? Productive. Produces a safe voyage. <laughs> oh, forget that. And are there not two classes of a Inquisitive art. What? No, he's gonna, he's gonna break it up, right? The class of uh, exchange between voluntary agents by means of gifts, wages, and purchase, and that which comprises all the rest of the acquittance uh, art. Oh, by the way, did you say we're trying to talk about two classes of the uh, acquisitive art? Yes. Did he mention two? No. One. Did he mention two? Three. Well, I'll take over. One class, exchange between voluntary agents by means of gifts, wages, and purchases, and, and the other. Oh, that's four. Cool. Which comprises all the rest of the acquisitive art. <laughs> Did he do it? No. Oh, don't worry about it. Last. Okay. How, how was it this? Well, could I, could I ask something? Here? Here? It seemed like in the prior paragraph he said that the acquisitive art was all coercive, right? That was part of the definition. All are engaged in coercing, right? He, in the prior paragraph, all the acquisitive arts are coercive. And then he says two classes one class of exchange between voluntary agents. Well, and then the contrast is with coercive. So he's like sneaked in 
a distinction without letting us know he's doing it. Then how many classes did he discover within the course of the art? Well, voluntary and or voluntary exchange and coercive. At least there might be more. What were you seeing, Brad? Because I didn't see how you looked at him. He said he didn't make. We're having trouble. He didn't make two classes because. Because um, he says right, which comprises all the rest of the acquisitive art. He's supposed to make two classes of acquisitive art. And he says it might be called coercive, so that's the name of it. One is voluntary, the other is coercive. Right. Right. In that paragraph. So it looked to me like a distinction between two classes. And, and yet he has... Thank you for saying. Oh, but there's, he, one, there's yeah. one, coercive. I didn't finish it. Right. And what's the other one? Voluntary. Voluntary. Voluntary exchange. Or exchange between voluntary agents. There's no coercion, in other words. So, we're now on the angle. Just a small question. This is describing how an angler may perform, or is he talking about two different kinds of angle? Come on, I need to know. Are there two kinds of angler? Or is one or is an angler or an angler and you can break up the way they function? <laughs> it looks like you break it up the way they function. Their object and how they proceed. Okay, look. I'm gonna less look at this. Now look at Well then, shall we not divide the coercive art into two parts? In what way? By calling all the open part of it fighting and all the secret part, hunting. Yes. But it would be unreasonable not to divide hunting into two parts. Uh, how, how is that done? By dividing it into hun hunting, of lifeless and living, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, and by the way, does it describe how you do both? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, wait a minute. Uh, let's go hunting. 
Okay? And uh, let's go hunting over the lifeless things, things that are dead. <laughs> have to do it secretly, though. Yeah. Yeah. That's what the ladies call shopping. <laughs> <laughs> Treasure hunting. Come on. How much? How much skill do you need for, for hunting things that are lifeless? None skill. No skill. Mm -hmm. well, if you're looking for gold. Yeah. That's, <laughs> what, that's what he needs. Yeah. You're oh. going to be digging rocks for And then he's going to make the distinction about I'm hunting of uh, uh, what's it really called? Called um, um, chain animal. <laughs> oh, it's a zoo. It's a zoo. You know, you can get a bunch of guys with guns and bows and arrows and go shoot a uh, cow. Uh, a cow. <laughs> they run too. They run away. They're contented. <laughs> Killing a contented cow. <laughs> it's still hunting. Right. <sighs> Would you agree? At least. Everything he's doing so far is very clear. Buddy. <laughs> it's funny though. It's so it's so he's muddying the water. So what can we say about how a sophist functions so far from what we've read tonight? <laughs> Good job. Hey. 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 Oh, yeah. like her, huh? So this is a very easy, easy work. Yeah. Uh, by the way, is it difficult to define what a sophist is? Maybe. No. Maybe. It just seems like a book. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't tell the truth. Well, we could put all the all these things together and all. Is it what here? What did you say? And is, and uh, and be persuaded about something that he does not know. So what do you make of it? So is he forcing the people that he's talking to? To ask him to be more exact or precise in what he's talking about, then, because the, the listener would have to be alert to try to get him to, yeah. to pinpoint exactly what he's talking about. Otherwise, like the Antidote's in here, he's going along with them. Don't you? Socrates suggests. The achievers. And the stranger said, Yeah, I'll, I'll pick it. Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll go on. What do you think the choice? As long as he's easy and he doesn't give him any trouble. <laughs> right. Okay. <laughs> Pick it up next week. Yeah. Oh boy. Okay, that'll be easy. As... Don't we have a seminar next week? Yes, we do. But we're still Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday. Sunday. Oh, we're not doing that Friday. Friday. Oh, boy.
Yeah.